and always get out as far into the community as they can. And so you can help me. Because one of the things I'm incredibly proud of is the fact that, um, for those of you that don't know, our hospital is affiliated with Dignity Health. Uh, and within the Dignity Health system, uh, within Dignity Health itself, there's three states of hospitals. And our emergency department has been named number one in the entire Dignity Health System for communication by physicians care by physicians. You know, so often I think people think that if you're in a small rural, rural community, you know, you can't be doing great work, and we can. In addition to that, California Department of Health and Human Services has recently given an honor to our Family Birth Center, which is also doing great things, and also has given um, uh, honors to uh, a program that we're working on in large part due to a grant received by Dr. Nathan Clayton, which is to work on a very serious issue in um, our community and across the country, and that's opioid addiction. And so your hospital's doing great work, um, I'd like to get more of that information in the community. Also, the other thing I'll tell you is we have some new physicians. Uh, you know, you might have heard me mention, I think in September, I told you Dr. Ron James is here, and um, he does orthopedics. Uh, recently here uh, is another orthopedics, um, Dr. Christensen. And coming very, very soon uh, is Dr. Jensen. She's an OBGYN. And then, oh, I'm just I'm blanking. Oh, Dr. Tortosa does hand surgeries. So we've got some great new physicians in our community doing great work. Uh, and I will tell you that um, this orthopedics group, uh, they're, they're really stellar. So if you know someone that's thinking of getting knee replaced, hip replaced, or anything, and thinks they have to go out of the community, there's really great service here. So. With that, it is my pleasure. I'm, I'm very excited by this topic personally, and um, I have to thank Barb DeGraw. I think Barb um, uh, was the one that enticed Stephanie uh, to, to join us. Stephanie Spencer uh, is, uh, I'm going to read this if you don't mind, she's going to talk to us tonight about uh, nutrition and I think specifically food labeling, um, which is a topic that I never know how to read a food label. Um, and she's a lecturer at Sacramento State University, the Department of Nutrition, Food and Science and Packaging, and she has a master's degree in nutrition. She also lives here with uh, her family in Nevada City, so we're really fortunate to have her. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming <coughs> Stephanie Spencer. So I teach at Sac State, and then I also teach at San Jose State, um, but people aren't usually interested in that. They're usually interested in my work at Sunset Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before the teaching, I managed the test kitchen there, um, so that was a lot of fun. So. I love food. Um, so with that, I will all get started. Um, so I'm going to talk today about making healthier choices. As a consumer, we're constantly inundated with information from so many sources. I'll tell you, teaching nutrition with students who are coming at you with all kinds of questions and they're seeing things in all sorts of places, so I know that it's challenging for them and I'm sure it's challenging for the consumer who's not taking nutrition courses. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about labels, ingredients and food and how to understand what's doing what. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about supplements and understanding choosing supplements and um, what some of the package labeling means. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you first uh, see a product in the store, you always see the what I would call the front of label marketing, right? Oh, we're talking label basics. We'll go here. So when you first see a product, you see a lot of these terms. And many consumers, in fact, have asked my husband, I said, do you ever look at the back of the label? <laughs> One person here knows him. Um, <laughs> the answer is no. Um, and that's true for a lot of consumers. I'm guessing that you're here, a lot of you are looking, but it's confusing, okay? Um, a lot of this stuff on the front, almost all of it means nothing, okay? I will tell you, I only look at the front of the package 
in order to see what I'm buying. This is all marketing terminology, and its purpose is to kind of convince you to buy that food. Okay? Um, things like sugar-free, yes, that has a, uh, you have to meet some qualifications for that, fat-free, but made with real fruit, immune support, all of this kind of stuff, really not important. What is important is what's on the back. And we, I'm really, this is perfect timing because the label is just changing this month. Okay? It has been delayed like five years, so it's really a good time. I didn't think it was going to happen, but it is, I, I, I double-checked before I came here. I'm like, oh, it goes into effect January 2020. Companies that make over $10 million have to have this in place this month. Companies that make under $10 million, they have um, until next year to make this change. Some of the big, I'm going to take this off because I keep turning. Um, some of the big changes, actually, do I see this on here? Uh, here highlights the differences. So the serving size is going to be larger with bolder type, which is I, it's one of the most important pieces of information that you can find on a label. So that's really key. Serving sizes are updated. How many of you eat a half a cup of ice cream ever? <laughs> no one, right? So they're changing those to realistic portions. So like the 20 ounce soda, somebody gets a 20 ounce soda and they think, oh, I only had this much. They're reading what is an 8 ounce or 12 ounce serving, right? And most people would drink it in a serving. So it's going to be a lot more useful, so that's good. Um, the updated are daily values. To be honest, I don't pay any attention to that. So I'm not going to really touch on that here. But you can look that up. It's only something that's related to food labels, daily values. Um, added sugars. This is the key, most important piece that I'm so excited about. And before, as a consumer, and I'm going to talk specifically about sugar um, further, as a consumer, you're trying to cut sugar, right? Most people are. It's, I think, one of the largest, if not the largest contributor to most of our um, diseases that are diet-related. Um, and you couldn't really make good choices about this. You go to a store, you want to buy a yogurt, and it says it has 20 grams of sugar. Well, there's natural sugar in yogurt. What is natural? What is added? Now we're going to see that, okay? So that's huge, and I'm going to talk to a little bit more about that in a second here. Um, I'm going to keep orderly, otherwise I'll get really off track. Um, let's see. The Where are we? Oh, it has a new footnote. That's not really that important. The four nutrients that are listed um, have changed. It used to have vitamin A and vitamin C, but now we have vitamin D and potassium because those are ones that are more important for health, and they're ones that people tend to be um, deficient in. Uh, potassium acts as sodium's antagonist, so if you have high blood pressure, that's something you want to have a lot of fruits and vegetables because that's helpful. Um, let's see. So, let's talk a little bit about sugar. Where sugar hides. <laughs> So, sugar is sneaky. This is just a list of 61 types. There are many more types of sugar in food products. Um, and I used to work in food product development. <laughs> in fact, the reason I quit that is I really had a hard time with putting certain things in products. Um, I remember distinctly making a pizza sauce for a manufacturer, and it had more high fructose corn syrup than tomato. And if you look at pizza sauces, never buy pizza sauce. Um, always buy like tomato or marinara. They're almost half sugar. It's really, it was shocking to me. I didn't realize it. But um, what the tricky part about this is, if you buy a candy bar, it'll have high fructose corn syrup, it'll have table sugar or something like that. Where you see more of these other types are what I call pseudo health foods, okay? And with the label change, this should get a bit better, but what manufacturers were able to do is they could take multiple types of sugar, divide it up, basically, so that sugar wouldn't come to the top of the label. Because ingredients are listed by weight on, an, um, on a label, so if you're a consumer, you can go, oh my gosh, this has sugar as the number one ingredient. But what pseudo-health kind of companies would do, typically you'll see this in a lot of, a lot of um, granola bars, things like that, um, with coatings, they'll use a bunch of these types, okay? And I'll tell you what, to your body, they're almost identical, okay? Um, and you're gonna, you know, people hate high fructose corn syrup. I'm not here to tell you it's healthy, but I am here to tell you it's almost identical to table sugar. It's 55% fructose to 45% glucose. Table sugar is just 50-50. 
So they're very slightly different, and most of these sugars fall somewhere in that range. So your body kind of recognize the, recognize the, recognizes them as the same thing. So as a consumer, these are things that I would look for. If you see a ton of different things like this on your healthy bar that you're buying, or cereal, something like that, um, they're playing this trick. I remember working on products for a health-related company, and one of the key products we used was brown rice syrup. If you've ever bought or seen it, it's sugar. It's essentially just honey, and it's, you know, it's a syrup form of sugar. Um, date, I don't know if you see date, any of those kind of things on here. Um, so they sound healthy, and certainly things like honey, they're gonna have a little antioxidant benefit. They might have a few things, but not in large amounts. So you should still think of them as a sugar. Maybe they're a slightly better choice than a table sugar. Um, but, um, so I, that's what I want to say about sugar. And now I wanted to talk about uh, understanding label ingredients. So um, this is something I teach when I talk about food processing and packaging. Wait a minute, can I ask what time I'm at? Uh, 5.52. Okay. okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to go over these different categories. Um, so the first one here, these are the categories that are, food, are added to different foods. And they all serve different functions. Some have you know, negative health consequences, and I'll try to go through those um, different ones. Um, the reason that we would add things to food is not just because we want to add things to food um, to do something. It would be to improve its appeal, whether that's aroma, flavor, texture, something like that. Um, the main one is improving shelf life, okay? We should all eat foods that are fresh, and that's great, but in order to be where we are today, like having jobs and having careers and not spending all our day looking for food, we do have to store food, right? Food does have to live, you know, out on the shelf. So we have to do some things that increase shelf life. Also, manufacturers are responsible for protecting nutrients. So some of the additives are added to protect nutrients because loss occurs. You pick an apple from a tree or an orange from a tree, you're having loss. Right? You cook it at home or do whatever, every, t every little action along the way um, is causing some sort of loss in nutrients. Um, when I teach food processing, the one thing I want my students to take away from that um, is that all foods are processed. So saying, processed foods are bad, it's like, no, 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 no. That apple, it was harvested, someone had to grow it, it got washed, it got packaged, all of these different things. It's the degree of processing. Okay, so there's processed foods, which could be whole foods, there's processed food ingredients like whole wheat flour, olive oil, those are processed food ingredients, and then we have highly processed food. Pop-tarts <laughs> would fit into that category, which I remember having as a kid and I loved. Safety. The other reason that you want to have uh, these things added is safety. Um, things like botulism and bacterial contamination, all of that can affect food. So these serve a purpose. I want to make that clear. I do think that you should have less of these things. Better foods have less of these things, but they do serve a purpose. They're not all evil, and I wanted to talk about um, the different categories. So the first category, they're called sequestrants and antioxidants. And um, one of the things that really harms food is oxidation. So this is what causes fats to go bad, things like that, um, and browning of fruits. That results in a lot of food waste. It's unsafe for us to eat, particularly, particularly when lipids oxidize. That's what causes free radical damage. You might know about that. Um, so we want to stop that because it ruins the food. It's bad for our health. Um, so sequestrants, basically, they trap these free, they're called free metal ions, um, and they prevent that reaction from happening. Antioxidants sort of, um, I don't want to say like act as like a volleyball, not a volleyball, but like a thing to bang against, <laughs> like a blockade, if you will. Um, so examples of those that I have here, malic acid, ascorbic acid, um, those are natural ones that are used in the industry. And then there's artificial ones like BHA, which is butylated hydroxy anisole. Um, then the next category we have here are bulking agents. So you're gonna typically see 
bulking agents in things that are reduce fat, reduce sugar, things like that. I'm going to talk about or a little bit about artificial sweeteners, but for example, something like sucralose um, has about 200 to 600 times the sweetness of table sugar. So imagine having you know 600 you know little crystals of table sugar to one little table crystal of sucralose. That is very hard to disperse, right? Um, so you couldn't put it in a packet, that wouldn't be easy. And also when you're baking, for example, you can't just have one crystal to all that. Sugar is doing more than just providing sweetness, it's providing bulk, it has a lot of functional capability, in, especially in baked goods. So you have to replace that. And so you add a kind of a neutral, uh, low flavor, typically a carbohydrate, um, bulking agent. Maltodextrin is a very common one. Sorbitol is a sugar alcohol. Um, so it has some calories, but very few. And you'll see that in products like that. So you'll see it in like reduced fat ice creams will have these added, um, or maltodextrin typically. Um, and all your sweeteners, all your artificial sweeteners or any reduced sugar product will have these bulking agents. And they're basically there for dispersion and to kind of add volume. The next category are colors. So there are two broad categories of colors. There are natural and artificial. Um, natural are ones that are derived from nature. So annatto is a common one. Anyone ever had achiote or anything with achiote? It's, you, if you go to, I want to try that Mexican uh, market in Auburn that I keep passing. Um, but it's a paste and it's used in um, one of the Mexican dishes, is, it's called cochinita pibu, but it's a, like a bright red, reddish orange hue. So that's used in a variety, of, um, it's used in butter typically um, to give it a little bit of coloring. Not always, but sometimes. So that's a natural colorant. There are colorants made from mugs that are red. Um, that people, Star, Starbucks got in big trouble for that one. Um, because they didn't label it. Now it has to be labeled. Um, then there's artificial ones, and the FDNC stands for food and drug. Mission, I believe, um, and there's about seven of these that are approved. Some have health effects, some do not, or none known, I should say. I'll, I'll put a little caveat in this right now. Nutrition is a new science. It started, I believe, like a vitamin was first defined in 1910. That's like 100 years compared to hundreds and hundreds of years of you know other sciences. So oh, I always like people to consider that as an evolving science. So. What I say today about their safety may change tomorrow, and it has. I remember teaching about, oh, what was it, some sort of nutrient, and it's totally flip-flop, so uh, you never know. Um, but anyway, so those are the two categories of colors. Then we have emulsifiers. Oh, I want to say about colors. People don't like artificial colors. Um, many are banned in other countries. Um, we tend to allow more, but there is a definite change in that. So. Um, I always talk to my students about getting into clean label because people are very into what's in the, their food more than ever before. So clean label alternatives are these natural food additives, but they're not as stable, so they can't be used in all applications. Artificial can be used in pretty much anything. They're very heat stable, light stable, um, all of that. So they have to they have a little work to do, I think, to make find make and find colorants that are more stable. Or they could just not color our food as much. Um, that would be a good idea. Um, the next category I have here are emulsifiers. And what emulsifiers do is they basically bring two things that don't mix, they bring them together and hold them in solution. Um, like your vinaigrette, right? So mustard can provide like a temporary emulsion. Egg is a common emulsifier because it has something called lecithin and it takes water loving and the water heating component and it basically ties them together. So emulsifiers are used in all your salad dressings, things like that. They can be derived from soy and they can be derived from egg yolk, that's the typical um, place that you see them derived from. They also prevent crystallization in chocolate and other fatty foods, so you'll often see emulsifiers in chocolate. Um, and then, oh, breads, they help with staling in breads, so they serve a lot of functions. So. Um, I think they're pretty innocuous. I wouldn't be too concerned um, with seeing something less thin, but I'm sure you can find something to the contrary. For every nutrition thing, you can find something controversial. Um, and then we have polyglycerol esters. That's another example of studies you would see. Um, then we have phosphates. 
So phosphates are a huge uh, category of additives. They do all sorts of different things. They can act as sequestrants, they can act as antioxidants, and they can um, act just as a typical acid in food. Um, ones that you often see are phosphoric acid. So pretty much all sodas will have phosphoric acid and it provides like a tart note to um, sodas. It also provides some preser preservation as well. Chemical, oh, here we are, I'm behind. Um, chemical leavening, leavening agents. These do what you think they do, right? They help to rise um, products. Um, I have yeast on there, which is not a chemical leavener, but it's a common one that would be used. Um, baking soda, baking powder, those are the ones you'd use at home, right? Um, and then there are commercial ones that can be used as well. So that's their job. They're pretty, pretty, pretty known, I would say. Then we get into antimicrobials. So their job is to prevent bacterial or microorganism contamination. So these are really important for food safety, um, particularly for vulnerable food products. We're coming a long way in terms of packaging um, and processing foods, which is really cool to see. You seen those avocados? The, I mean, the guacamole in the, um, the, the where the plastics right, the film, excuse me, it's right on the package. I think, how do they do this? <laughs> At least I was. And it's, they do it with pressure, so you can actually process foods with, um, uh, sorry, agitation. Um, it's really pretty interesting. So that's how those are made, which I think is cool. Um, but common antimicrobial sulfide, sulfur or um, sulfites are used in dried fruits, things like that, um, for preservation. Cultured dextrose is used. I don't have it on here, um, but all sorts of acids can help with that as well. Um, See. Oh, I don't have it on there for some reason. But nitrites, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about nitrites. Do you know what? People probably know what nitrites. They've heard about them. Are they good for you? No. <laughs> right. But so they are an antimicrobial. We, if you want to have preserved meats, you got to have them, right? Because they're, otherwise it would not be safe to consume. They help with color. If you didn't have them in preserved meats, it would be like a grayish brown, your uh, cured meats. Um, what we're seeing now, though, as a clean label alternative is celery juice powder or celery extract or something like that. And so consumers see that and they go, oh, that's great. It's not going to have nitrites added. Well, <laughs> celery is really high naturally in nitrite. In fact, there's some evidence that it forms higher, uh, they have to often use higher dosages. And because it's not regulated, celery extract is not regulated, whereas nitrites are very regulated in terms of their usage and how much you can use, you can actually have a higher level. And that leads to the production of what are called nitrosamines, which are what are potentially cancer-causing agents. So that's something to just be aware of. So just because it says celery extract doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it, but you just need to limit those foods. With all of this, and this is, no, this is why no one likes it when I talk, sorry. Um, but moder you just have to have moderation in all the things, right? Um, I remember dating a guy one time, and he said to me, what is the one food I can eat a lot of? Like, just a ton of. And I was like, there's nothing. <laughs> because even lettuce in high quantities would have some pesticide, pesticide residue or something, right? So everything, in moderation, Julia Child had it right. Um, let's see, flavors. So that's um, antimicrobials. Flavors, we've got natural and artificial. Um, it's kind of fun. Flavor chemistry is really an interesting area of food science. Um, but basically, you can derive them from natural um, processes like cooking food, and they kind of have these chambers, and they collect that vapor and can make flavors. Um, or they come up with artificial, so they'll have people who you know are trained in this. So vanilla would be a natural one, and vanillin. Usually there's some sort of change in the name. Um, there's a lot of different regulations about how to label that. Um, then we have flavor enhancers. So you've got your flavor, strawberry is a flavor, peach is a flavor, vanilla is a flavor, chicken is a flavor, um, but in flavor enhancers just bring up or up the ante of that flavor. They are typically used for umami type foods, cup of noodles <laughs> would be one of those. You see that's why MSG is added, it really brings out that meatiness, that beefiness. There is very little evidence that MSG causes the effects that it's been um, associated with, which is really kind of interesting, but um, it's one of those uh, things that persists in uh, popular media, which is, you know, your personal choice. 
But as an alternative, people are looking for cleaner options, and those are autolyzed yeast extract, so if you see that, sometimes it's abbreviated AYE, or HVP, which is hydrolyzed vegetable protein, so that's another one that you'll see. Um, acids, these can be antioxidants, these can act to keep the pH in a safe range. Different microorganisms really like different pH ranges, different um, quantities of sugar, that sort of thing, so um, they can help with that. Sweeteners, so we talked a little bit about sweeteners already. There are these two categories, um, nutritive and non-nutritive. And all that means is nutritive are the ones that provide the calories, right? And non-nutritive, they technically have a little bit of caloric content, but so negligible that they're called non-nutritive. These are the ones that are hundreds of times sweeter than sugar. The only one that is considered quote unquote natural is stevia right now, um, or truvia. Those are the, they usually have a chemical name and then a brand name is how we typically see them. Do I see anything about sweeteners? Oh, different sweeteners. The issues with artificial sweeteners are, of course, aftertaste. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, some have more than others. I found that people have different um, degrees on what bothers them. I can't stand stevia, <laughs> but I found a lot of people think that's just great. So to me, that's the most bitter of these. Um, some are approved in the U.S. and not approved in other, not approved in other countries, and vice versa, which is actually interesting to me. Um, and they don't have the properties of sugar, right? So we have, that's why we add the bulking agents. Um, we have to use sometimes different ones in tandem if we're baking or heat or cold. So it really kind of depends on each individual one. Um, and then lastly, we have sodium reducers because high blood pressure is increasingly a problem. There are, um, it's typically only one, it's potassium chloride is the main sodium reducer. I remember my grandparents used to have it. Um, in the cabin, in a little jar, um, and it basically replaces some of the sodium with potassium, but it often has like sort of a metallic, bitter taste that some people um, don't enjoy. What's really interesting about salt and consumption of salt is it only takes, I want to say, 21 days, something like that. Of course, it's individualized to reduce your taste for salt. Think about how after you're sick, all of a sudden when you're well again, you really taste food. Um, in a stronger way, so you can reduce your salt threshold if you kind of lower it gradually. Okay, and then, uh, now I'm totally switching gears a little bit, but I wanted to talk about this um, since moving here. I love living here, um, but I think it's an area where uh, supplement use is kind of high, higher than um, I'm maybe accustomed to. So I wanted to talk about um, something called DSHEG. So uh, it's called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. So before, and this went into place in 1994, so before 1994, there were very few supplements on the market. Um, they were almost re regulated like drugs. And then due to industry lobbying, um, this, uh, they basically won, and this, what this did is deregulate the supplement industry. So there are some consequences of that, and, um, and I'm just gonna talk to you about how, many, how you can make better choices and understand what you're seeing. Whether you consume them or not is, you know, totally a personal choice. Um, so the first one, um, the first type of claim, there are three type of claims that you can make for labels, and one is a nutrient content claim. So you can see something on a label that says good source of calcium or high in omega-3s. These all must meet certain criteria that's set by the FDA. So these are called nutrient content claims. They're pretty innocuous. Then we get into the second category. These are health claims. Um, they link a food or supplement with a reduced risk of a disease. So there's some sort of a disease mentioned and something that is mentioned to reduce it. So you would see something like this. Adequate, I just copy these from labels. Adequate calcium and vitamin D as part of a healthful diet, along with physical activity, may reduce the risk of osteoporosis in later life. Three or three grams of soluble fiber from oatmeal daily in a diet, low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, and then it would have to say the cereal has two grams per serving or whatever it has. This requires what's called significant scientific agreement. So they have to meet a lot of research. There's a lot that is required of these types of claims. Anytime you, anytime you mention a disease. The issue are these guys. 
And this is where we get into really gray sort of area. What they do, they're called structure function claims. So they cannot mention a disease state, otherwise they'd be, um, they would get a citation from the FDA. And they do, you can go on their website and see who's gotten cited for everything. It's pretty fun. I have a friend who works for the FDA, and I'm like, oh, this company got busted, and this company got busted. Um, but anyway, uh, they describe a potential effect on body structure or function. Calcium helps build strong bones. If you see that as a consumer, you're gonna think, oh, that's gonna help with my osteoporosis, right? Because strong bones, you're gonna make that association. If you see fiber helps promote bowel regularity, you might so associate that with prevention of any sort of GI disorder, but they're not doing that, okay? They can make any claim they want, essentially, when they, with this, uh, in this structure function category. So again, this is what changed in 1994, and this is, to me, a huge disadvantage to consumers, okay? Because it kind of puts the onus on you, right, to make choices and to read these things, and I don't think most consumers are aware of this or are capable of understanding all of this, and I don't think it's necessarily fair. Um, and you would see this disclaimer. This statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Um, so it's something to, I wanted to mention because I think it's important. So how do you make better choices with regard to supplements? There are two really great sources um, for information. Um, it's so important, since you're all for the Hospital Foundation, to mention to your doctor if you're taking supplements. Most drugs derive from some sort of plant or natural thing, and many supplements or natural things can have a drug-like effect. St. John's wort, for example. Sometimes people take that for depression, but it has serious implications um, and reactions. So you don't want to take things like this. Um, I have a, uh, this story I would tell in one of my classes about B12 supplementation, and it was this gymnast and her uh, trainer had told her, oh, she was having some sort of trouble. And um, he told her to take B12 supplements, right? And B12 is something that, as we get older, we usually become somewhat deficient in. So that is important. You may need to supplement with that later. But she was young, um, and so he recommended supplementation for her, and it caused neuropathy. She actually fell on the bars and broke her leg and ended her career <laughs> in gym. You know, because when you're a young gymnast, that's kind of, you're done. So something like that can have a consequence. There are toxicities with all of these things. Um, you cannot typically have a toxicity issue from eating foods. That is just not a thing. So you could eat, you know, I know one person who did get orange from eating too many carrots. That can happen. In fact, they used to have like tanning creams that were actually just high dose beta carotene and they just made you a little orange, which is hysterical. Um, why do we do this, women, to ourselves? But um, anyway, so the two great sources are National Institute of Health, Office of Dietary Supplements. You can go on there and look things up. Um, and I can share this with you guys um, somehow. Um, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Um, that's a really great site. Tons of great information on alternative therapies. You can go ahead and look up the supplement you're interested in taking. But <laughs> a lot of supplements have issues with um, contamination, particularly from made in for certain countries. I personally wouldn't take a supplement that was made in China. For example, so I would pay attention to where your supplement is made or manufactured. Um, and then I would also probably want to check one of these places. They don't tell you if it's um, safe for its use, and they don't tell you um, about interactions. You would need to look that up or talk to your doctor. But they will tell you that they contain what they said they contain, and they don't have contaminants. And that's a big thing because some of these supplements will have things like lead, um, there's been arsenic, I mean, hot, cadmium, all, all kinds of different heavy metals, things like that, have been found in supplements, so this is a real, these are good tools, um, but they're just um, seals, essentially. They're not um, going to tell you, you know, this is good for this condition, but they're good sources. Um, where am I? Did I have to stop looking? I didn't look at you. You're at 616. Huh? You're oh, okay. Yeah, we got lost time. Um, I'm pretty much done. But I wanted to say, with all this said, I think one of the main things that people, two main takeaways. Um, natural doesn't always mean healthy. That's one something. Not all processed food is bad. Okay, I'm 
making three. And then I think one of the things that people do more than anything is they overthink everything they eat. Um, food should, eating is fun, it should be fun, it should be done in moderation. I don't, I think most people overthink all of it. Um, and I think if we thought a little bit less, relaxed, enjoy the food we ate, we'd probably all be a little bit better off. Um, and with that, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. They have to meet criteria for that. So there are some differences, like you might see uh, made with organic ingredients. I think that's like 70% organic. Um, there's like a 70% amount, 90%, and 100. So I think 70% is the made with organic ingredients. 90%, I believe, is when it says organic, and then 100% organic is all organic. They can't. It's very hard to get this organic spices. That's very hard to do because grown in nature, sometimes they have bugs and contaminants. There are allowable insect parts in all the foods we eat. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yes? Okay. What about uh, USP third party and endorsement on supplements that uh, say that they have Yes, yeah, so that's, so the uni, uni, oh, United okay. States Pharmacopeia. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. So if you see that, that's a good indication. It's not, but it's basically saying the amount that is, it, it says what it said it has what it says it has which is not true they've done tests on a lot of these supplements and they don't necessarily have any effective or active ingredients so um there's a, just a joke that i tell my students but that people in the united states have the most expensive urine in the world <laughs> because some like vitamin c for example people love to supplement vitamin c once your tissues are saturated with vitamin c out it goes <laughs> So once, they're, once you've got what you need, um, those water-soluble vitamins, they don't hang on with you. Fat-soluble ones, they last, and those are the ones that you're likely to have toxicity with, A, D, E, and K. Those are your fat soluble. Other questions? It can be unrelated. So again, because I can't really interpret this very well, but... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so if you're looking at supplements or anything to find good quality, and you know, not just obviously by price necessarily, but just don't have a lot of extra fillers and that type of thing. That's whatever you know supposed to be done. Whether it's supposed to be absorbable, whatever it is that is for that particular vitamin. Your best source to go to to find products as a consumer, you're saying would be. Rare. I would look. I would check out these different organizations. The bottom three. The first two are going to advise you about the specific <coughs> supplement, whatever it is. These bottom three, though, are not going to talk about bioavailability. I think you kind of touched on that a little bit about how much your body actually absorbs and how much goes out the window. Um, so those won't answer that. Unfortunately, we don't have those answers. There's no source for that. So you need to use guidance. I would use a medical professional, somebody who you know maybe is researches these companies. Maybe they've gone there, they've met them. You know that would be somebody I might turn to also. Stephanie, I was just going to say, if you don't mind providing to us your PowerPoint, we can yeah, put yeah, it on the website. Yeah, certainly. I knew that that was... I was hoping they would all have shorter links. <laughs> Not, you know, more abbreviated, but they so did. We'll put it on our website yeah, there yeah. if people want to download it for the information they can. Sorry. Okay. Other questions? Yes? How about uh, the foreign water where it says no sugar? Oh, those are funny to me. Those crack me up. It's like a, it's like a gluten-free yeah. sparkling water. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they don't normally have sugar, right? But they know that again. That's your front of label marketing, right? They they know there's a consumer out there who is turning to a sparkling water as a sugar-free alternative. So they know if they put that on there, they're likely to sell it. But it never had sugar to begin with. Yeah. They add, usually add artificial or natural, it just depends on the manufacturer. There's some that use juice. I like that one that um, was water there. Yes. That's <laughs> um, okay. Oh, did I answer that? Okay. okay. Other questions? Many, many years to have it banned. It's banned in Europe. Yeah, 
that's an interesting one. That's coming up now, and I have been reading some about that. I wouldn't see it. That's why I say that this changes. Like trans fats, for example. Those, those were originally, and I always try to tell my students, manufacturers don't, sometimes, some are devious, I'm not going to say they're not, but they don't necessarily come up with these things like, oh, I'm going to like try to hurt people. <laughs> trans fats was a very, I think they, well, it was originally, I want to say, invented in Napoleon and, and French Revolution, um, the, the process. And then during wars and different things like that, it was a cheap source. It was a way to make fats not go bad as quickly. And only later do we learn that, that just that little chain from cis to trans um, had really quite negative consequences. So um, that's not to say so Carrageenan. When I was in school, so like you know, 15 years ago, I don't know, um, <laughs> that we, we learned that that was like nothing. Like, no big deal, it's just from algae, it's just, you know, because kelp is very healthy, like, there's a, a lot of those are quite delicious, they're uh, part of the cuisine in Ireland and other cultures as well, um, but that's not to say, that that's why natural doesn't always equal healthy, because sometimes there's a consequence later. Evolving, okay, so that's an evolving area. I don't personally think there's enough evidence for that. Um, I was kind of getting on the bandwagon, and then I read more research that made me change my mind, so I would kind of, I'm here right now, <laughs> in the neutral zone. Um, re the only reason they're stating that is because they're kind of, new research is being done to, into the gut microbiome and the role that plays. That's, or I would call this very early in the gut like because I've noticed even there's a lot of backstepping on what people were even just months ago talking about with gut microbiome. I think it's interesting, and I think it could, but the microbiome changes very rapidly. It changes all the time. So it's kind of hard to study, right? So that was the idea. The idea is that these artificial sweeteners um, are affecting our gut microbiome in a way that causes us to hold on to or perhaps gain weight. That's the idea. Um, so that's why some people think they're worse than regular sugar. I will say, well, I was going to say that earlier about sugars, um, about artificial sweeteners. There is, even though there's very little evidence of, of negative effect, except for ones that have been banned, there are some of the most studied substances that exist. Um, there is no evidence that they result in weight loss. So that does not exist. So is, should you take them? Because <laughs> what people do is go, oh, I have that diet soda, and then I'm going to have french fries because I have a diet soda. Um, and so they need it. It's just not a, it doesn't really have a benefit. So if you like it and you want to have it, sure. But And certainly if you're diabetic um, and you want to have something sweet and that might be a, you know, a reasonable alternative, I wouldn't want to deny you that. But I also don't think most consumers, it's not really beneficial. There's no nothing showing that. Would you recommend taking a probiotic? Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, that's a really interesting one. Um, and I, I used to say that I would, because I did. And, and it really depends on the probiotic. Um, it has to be the right strain for the right condition for the right thing, and that's very hard to do. Um, and so I just read something recently that kind of changed my mind on that because it's so hard to pinpoint. You can't just throw a bunch of um, random probiotics or um, you know things and have it affect what you're trying to have it affect, essentially. Some of them are not coded or treated in a way that they even get into your system. They have to be what's called enterically coded, and that's basically like coding on a pill that makes it so that it can survive um, this acid of the stomach because the small intestine is where everything really gets absorbed, but it's got to survive that journey. So if you're not buying the right supplement, you're not getting anything. Does that answer that? Hopefully. So that was unfortunately, a lot of like everything in nutrition, we're still uncertain on lots of things, yeah. Yes? Oh, that's interesting, that's a good, you guys make good ones. <laughs> I taught a cl cooking class for Sierra to harvest, and somebody asked me some question about, they, oh, they wouldn't, consume any uh, vegetable oils of any sort. And I was so taken aback by that, because that was the first time I've ever encountered that. Um, 
I think they're good. I mean, most of them are good. I, some people don't like canola. There's, I've read some negative things. Um, I think it's a good oil. Um, personally, I don't have any issues. I would recommend olive oil. That's the one that um, kind of always ends up at the top. Um, I am not a proponent of coconut oil. I am sorry to say. <laughs> Um, at the end of the day, it's a satur predominantly a saturated fat, um, and people go, oh, that's medium chain triglyceride, and, and this is my answer to them. In countries where coconut oil is the main fat, heart disease is the main disease, right? Just like anywhere else. So it's, it's, not, it's not doing what we think it's doing. If you like it, you can use it in moderation, just like any oil. I use butter. I use olive oil. I have all the oils at home. <laughs> I have vegetable, I have canola, I have olive oil, I have coconut oil. Because I develop recipes, um, sometimes freelance, so sometimes they'll want that. I think it has a coconut flavor, typically, so I don't want that in everything. So I, I use, personally, I use olive oil. I used to work at an olive oil company um, in Paso Robles, where we made artisan olive oil. It's amazing to see, and, it's, and I, when you buy good olive oil, it's hard to go back. So, and if you buy kind of artisanal olive oil, it's incredibly high amounts of so many good things, much more than your store bought. So, I like olive oil. That would be my go-to. What's your take as far as ghee, clarified butter versus um, just even regular organic butter? Do you have any take on that? that to my only take on that is it's the cooking functionality. So, yes, I know people, you know, have think it has nutritional. I do not agree with that. Um, but it doesn't, um, it, it basically increases the smoking point. So if you're going to cook with it, it, it actually raises it higher than something like olive oil, and then you have fewer negative effects from like cooking oil at a high heat. So it's very useful in that. Also tastes great. <laughs> so I think all of those, I, sometimes I use butter and olive oil in tandem. Um, I, I wouldn't, I just don't think, I think, again, this is where I come back to like the overthinking. If, it, if you use all these things in moderation, I don't think having just one is probably the answer, to be honest. So I like it. I wouldn't switch to it as my primary oil. I would still always stick with a, a liquid or a less saturated oil as my primary oil and use all those other um, sort of as little additions. Does that make sense? And your relationship between good fats and brain health? Good? That is good. <laughs> I, I can't wait for the day that we... I think we're in that day. Where fat is the enemy is kind of gone away. I think if you look at charts of when these diseases that we're seeing now, diabetes, things like that, when they increased is when we kind of, what we call in nutrition, the war on fat, um, when that began. And what we did is we replaced it with sugar. And, and that's what happened, and refined carbohydrate. And we know those are not helping us out. Fat provides satiation. It does a lot of, it lubricates, it's, it's a good thing. I don't think you should switch a 50% fat diet, but you want to have at least that 30%. Um, when these low fat, they're not sustainable. Any diet you should do, and I didn't talk about diets, but should be one that you could be on the rest of your life. So I don't think you should do any sort of change that means you can't have a piece of birthday cake or whatever your kryptonite is. Um, your glass of wine, I would never be on that diet. Um, so I would just, those are the things that I would do. But yeah, the fat, I... Pro-fat. <laughs> we don't have a no low fat cheese in our house. I get very upset if I see something like that. Um, but anyway, yeah. Anything else? I think I probably want to for one more. Maybe I don't. No. Okay, thank you very much for having me.